uh, origins of that name as well as okay. uh, how it works. So with no further ado, let's take a look. Cool. Um, uh, probably, probably one of the things that there's several approaches to finding new vulnerabilities in products, uh, and and some of these approaches are more economical of your time and energy than others, and cover a different range of. Uh, how many vulnerabilities you're going to find for a certain given amount of effort. Uh, I'd like to briefly talk with you guys today about uh, doing a bit of stress testing, slightly automatically, but also a little bit more intelligently. Um, at Stake itself is, is a pure place security consulting firm, and we do uh, work for a number of corporate clients. And part of that work is often research into finding vulnerabilities in their products. At, or, or in a, perhaps a third party's products. So things like uh, share fuzz uh, become something that we work on quite heavily. Um, this is the agenda. Um, just to, to demonstrate the technique, I, I chose a popular uh, Unix, a Solaris. Although this particular program, uh, share fuzz, only works against Unix or with Unix. Um, it, it's, it's very easy to, to sort of take the ideas presented and port them to other OSs, other architectures, and, uh, and use them effectively. Solaris remains the most popular Unix. When we, when we walk into a client, it's, uh, it's often their, their key servers. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a key part of the internet infrastructure in almost every way, and so it makes a, a, a good place to start looking if you're looking for new vulnerabilities, which we often are. And so to demonstrate uh, how to find vulnerabilities with SharePlus, I chose Solaris. Um, key systems, uh, this, this includes your banks and, and all your other friendly large financial institutions are all based on Solaris. And, and they still you know, sell quite a few licenses every day. Um, just to, for the example here, although the technique itself is applicable to other sorts of forms of engineering and I'll get more into how, how, what the technique is in a few seconds. Um, I've included a few pictures of satellite dishes for your happy viewing. But uh, there's, there's many ways to obtain user level access onto a Solaris box and the, the goal of this particular exercise I'm going to run through is finding a way to get root level access from user level access. Um, and, and I just listed a few of the ways people tend to gain a user account illicitly on a machine. This was before I knew how to do boxes in PowerPoint, so it might be a little small. I did this in uh, paint. So the, the basic three-tiered architecture is this, and, and yes, just to get a little background. The, the, when you get that, an account on that web server, let's say you hacked Netscape Enterprise Server, as people commonly do, uh, which was the first, I think, the green box. Uh, you, you then are running as an unprivileged user, and you, you will want to hide yourself, and to do this, you have to take root. And uh, the way Unix is designed, many local programs uh, are, are called set UID programs, run as super user when invoked by the normal user. Uh, this means, you know, if I hack them, I, I am now the Netscape Enterprise Server user, and when I run a set UID program temporarily, I can, uh, I can, I can run, do certain actions that the program does, as the super user or root. Uh, and when analyzing these set UID programs to see if there's a bug which you can exploit to make them do other things, it's, it, you have to look at any sort of user supplied data, any data that I can provide as input to this program. This includes arguments to the program, just on the command line, uh, environment variables, input from my shell session, uh, anything that it touches on the network, signals, anything that can really touch the program that I can influence. So the way uh, modern OSs have developed, they, they often have a core set of functionality that they embody in a set of libraries that every program has access to and can use. And many programs will link the same library and take advantage of those APIs. Uh, in, in Unix's case, these are shared libraries. In Windows's case, this is going to be the DLL functionality, and, and to some larger extent, the, the DCOM functionality. Um, just to show just a few basic Unix uh, functions that, that are often used to get input from a user, 
We have all the, the sort of get end, which gets environment variables. We have any of the locale related calls, which uh, you, could, you could send. You could say, hey, I would like to speak Korean to this program, and the program would, would then speak Korean. Uh, get S or scan F or read or any of those sorts of functions, which take in uh, user input. And of course, the XDR related functions, which uh, handle data marshalling in the Sun RPC protocol and uh, basically transform one data format to another data format correctly. Um, all these functions represent a sort of way of getting input into the set UID program. So if I was going to look, instead of saying, well, let's track down in the source code, because I don't have source code, all the calls that could possibly be influenced by the user, instead, that's cool. instead, I can say, well, let's just look at a few of these, because I know for a fact the user can get data into these, or from these. So, that's kind of the theory behind this sort of technique for reverse engineering. And, and so it's, you're, you're overriding one of these, any one of these, and you're, you're making sure that it returns some data or you read what it says in a way that you gain information about the program and possibly uh, accelerate the vulnerability discovery process. So the term fuzzing, it, it's more like when you rub your hand backwards on a cat is kind of where, where that term sort of feels from. It's, it's basically repetitive but user-controlled stress testing of program's inputs. We're not simply throwing garbage data at a program automatically and having some other process try to see if it's exploitable. Because that would involve building a ton of AI into our stress testing pool. The AI, in this case, resides in the user, and the user is responsible for utilizing the stress testing tool in a particular intelligent fashion, and that's why it's not just you know, quality assurance. We're actually doing some analysis to try to probe the program in a particular way. Good fuzzers, of course, I mean, there's many fuzzers. Uh, EI sells a product called Retina, which primarily is a fuzzer. And, and you can write fuzzers from Perl programs and all sorts of other things. But a good fuzzer has a clear understanding of the protocol and the inputs that the program takes in. And, and we'll try to match that correctly and then mismatch it in a way that would make sense, that would possibly result in a, in a, in a broken program. Uh, the other benefit of a really good fuzzer is that it gives you kind of a feel for the way a program operates. It gives you some kind of additional data back. So just to refresh ourselves on shared libraries, and this was about when I learned how to change the colors. Um, the, the, we're just going to examine that the, the example here is password, but it could be any other set UID program. And password loads several shared libraries. I've listed three here, which are very, very common. And for example, the dynamic link shared library, which is actually in charge of handling shared libraries. The LDAP shared library, which allows the password uh, command to change your password on an LDAP server, if you configure it properly. And libc, which is kind of the bastion, the giant, um, you know, do, does everything uh, for most Unixes. And that will handle reading and getting environment variables and writing the files and all that stuff. So all of these talk directly to the OS kernel. And password never talks to the kernel. He only talks to these libraries. So there's this intermediary layer where all the data has to filter through at some point. So the way ShareFuzz works, and this diagram is slightly misleading in the sense that ShareFuzz is not just in between password and the libraries, it's also between the libraries and the other libraries. And the way all shared libraries can define inside themselves functions, and these functions then get exported to other people who've loaded them. And in all Unixes, there is a way, or in all modern Unixes, to say, load my library first. And anything that library provides, don't use from any other libraries. So what happens first is password loads ShareFuzz. And anything ShareFuzz decides to sort of export, these other libraries don't, don't get to, to use. So in a sense, when password thinks it's calling libc, it instead calls ShareFuzz. And when libldap thinks it's calling libc, it instead calls ShareFuzz. So this provides a way for us to sort of intercept and modify data as it passes through what would have been our standard input and output chain. So any of the standard library calls can be overwritten with some 
minor annoyances as you go into some of the more deeper nested things. But the basic sort of, you know, here's text, so before we hit pictures, is to, uh, is that when even that, even when any of those libraries call getM, we're going to provide the result. So what is this good for? This is good for program instrumentation in a, in a sort of primitive fashion. You're not looking at every single call the program makes. You only look at the calls that you know you're going to care about. So you're going to miss vulnerabilities with ShareFuzz or any automated stress testing tool. But the benefit is you kind of get to focus in on the, on the calls that you know are most dangerous. And you don't have to worry about the billions of false positives that would otherwise be generated if you had to look at everything. So you can find out what the, what the program is, is getting as input. You can find out how the program parses it. You can find out where does it read from files and when does it do this. So not only do you get sort of a, uh, a test of what it's looking for, but you also get kind of the runtime flow of the program. You get a feel for the, for the, the, the way the program sort of flows through its execution. Um, and, and in some cases, you can change program decisions on the, on the fly. Uh, and, and you can also sort of see if you capture the right like, functions, what does the program do with, with network input? So just to demonstrate the standard uh, method of, of using getM for, for people who aren't <coughs> Unix savvy. Uh, the, the program in question, in this case password, but it could be any other dynamically linked program, which is almost all programs, calls getM and gives it an gives it a argument, which is the name of the environment variable it wishes to request. libc then takes that call, goes into your environment, grabs that string, and returns what that, the contents of that environment variable are. In this case, uh, bin, user bin. That's just an example. Now you can request path, you can request your home directory, your username, all sorts of things that are in the environment. These are just strings in memory that, that libc knows how to find. But your program never has to know how to find these. It just says, get them, set them, and leave it alone. So this this implementation of ShareFuzz, and I've used ShareFuzz to find several things, but this particular implementation, whenever it gets a request from password, is just going to return a long string of A's. So no matter what is here, he always gets the same response. But in addition, ShareFuzz will print out the sort of result or what it asked for. So you say, what was I asked for? And then I turned him a long string, and he gave me the following behavior. And this is kind of a process you go through. Now, while you're using ShareFuzz, you can modify ShareFuzz to return other things. Instead of long strings of A's, return percent N's to look for format strings. Instead of that, return null to say failure. I didn't find that environment variable. So it's, it's, very, it's very easy to modify because it's so simple. And the idea itself is actually quite simple, and the code is like 50 lines long. And so it's not, in fact, an incredibly complex thing. What's complex is knowing how to use it and being able to, to, to feel your way through programs. So first we're going to go through some questions, if there are any. No questions. I either did a great job or a terrible job. <laughs> and I think uh, next we'll look at ShareFuzz and see, uh, see it actually working and see what I'm talking about. And we'll talk about the LDAP options overflow a tiny little bit and we'll discuss some of the defenses that uh, you can use against these sorts of things. I got a, I got a quick question. Sure. I, I, maybe you covered and I missed it, but I, I'm not sure how the share fuzz is the middle layer turned that path command, that accurate return into, into all A's. I, I missed why it's mapping the path name that it was a legitimate return to the get environment to all A's. Okay, so the, let me go back a little bit. Okay, so it's actually a, a part of this. It's because when the executable loaded up, the first thing it said was, hey, I need the following functions. And it said, OK, kernel, go get me the following functions. And the kernel said, well, we have that in libc and libldef and libdf. But I've specified as an argument on the command line that before it looks in those, it looks in share files. So now it asks for the following function. It asks for where's getm. And the program says, well, getm is in share files. Now libc has a getm, too. But it doesn't look there, because I've told it that I go first. 
So now whenever it does a get end, instead of going to libc and getting the proper result, it goes to main. Does that make sense? Yeah, so you're learning what was called simply by intercepting. Right. right. We simply get the stuff on the way to us. So A to U means there was a call to get in. Um, the string A is returned. Well, I choose whatever I want to return. I can return anything. All I know is that he came in and he said, can I please have path? And I said, no, well, yeah, sure, you can have this. So that, that's kind of the, the decision process you work. Are you using GeoFuzz like within your own testing laboratory? You're putting this on a square system to test vulnerabilities? You're actually putting this on some remote system where you're trying to no, substitute this in? You do this all, this is a lab exercise. Lab exercise. Right. You're looking for vulnerabilities. It's the very, very beginning of the process. So before you even try to write the vulnerability, you need to find some way to make the program be behave aberrantly. And, and ShareFuzz helps you do that. Okay, let's go to a demo, because demos are cool. All right, as you can see, or at least I, as I hope you can see, like that, we're logged in to, hmm, I don't really know how to change the font in Windows, so you're all going to have to suffer with a tiny little Windows font. But uh, we're logged into a Solaris 5.8 machine, reasonably patched. And uh, this vulnerability is, in fact, public. I wouldn't be showing you a vulnerability that Sun had not decided to patch already and, and that was not publicly known. But the technique itself is, is what I'm really trying to demonstrate here. So this is my directory. And as you can see, we have a ShareFuzz directory under that. So the first sort of little bit to ShareFuzz is this pull files thing here which really simply makes a directory called setuid and goes through the whole system looking for setuid files and copies them into the setuid directory and then unsetuids them. Now normally you would run sharefuzz as root and I just happen to know the demo works without being run as root. But the reason you run it as root is because each of these files behaves normally as if it was run as root and you're unsetuiding that. So you test it as root to maintain the integrity of your test. In this case, we're going to test it as a, as a normal user. So ShareFuzz uh, compiles cleanly under Solaris, Linux, and, a, and, and most of the other common Unixes. And whenever you're doing a, a, a shared library, you can always load it up. You can always say ld preload libd vanilla. So I can always load up my own shared libraries with any system executable that is not set UID. And it will then dutifully tell me, hey, it turns out I got loaded correctly and I'm working. And then, hey, check out what environment variables were used. So now it's telling me that these are the things it looked at. And it's not something I have to go through source code to find. These are the actual things that got called. If the source code says that it has 100 different get end calls, and I need to track each and every one of those down, but none of them actually ever get used, except when someone's using Kerberos or this or that, then, then I don't have to check all that now. Because now I know exactly what actually got called. So you can kind of investigate, you can kind of, you know, you learn a little bit about the way uh, binaries work by just reading the output. You can see that first it went through the LC all, and it said, what languages do I need to see? And then it went to columns and it said, is there a special sort of column format that I need to operate in? And that, that's, that's just what it's telling us with binls. Now notice that binls did not crash. Nothing weird happened. It just printed out that instrumentation data and then kept going. And that's kind of what you would see with a non-buggy program. So you told it to use a legitimate library there, right? Well, or is that yours? my library is the libd.so.one. Normally, programs load libc.so. I'm loading libd, because it's libd. See how it works? Yeah. So we can continue this with all sorts of, uh, well, been true apparently does not load us and has a bug. But let's go to suid. No, turns out I did not, in fact, pre-copy.
should all work and we should be all happy. And if I have to hack the box on the fly, that'll just be two demos in one. I think if you, <laughs> if you maximize the terminal window, it makes the uh, font bigger. Did that work? There's also priority. Right. 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 Well, you win as people. Is that better? Oh, wow. And you can watch me fumble about bigger. I don't know what happened there. But, uh, okay. All right. So now you can see I have my own copy of bin password and temp password. And what I'm going to do is override the get ends call and then call temp password. Temp password is going to think that I want to change my password as, as if it was bin password. And it's going to try to do its thing, even though it really doesn't have permissions to do its thing. And we're going to see what, what it sort of uh, has to say about that and how, how it operates. Now, as you can see, it loaded NLS path, which is uh, the, the path that it uses to find any sort of uh, locale information, like do I want it to talk in Korean or Bangladeshi or something. And it, 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 it looked at that quite a lot. And then it grabbed this LDAP options environment variable, and then it died. And the reason it died was there is, in fact, an overflow after it grabs this LDAP options library, like little environment variable. And it goes and tries to parse that in a particular way, dies. And it dies in, a, in an exploitable way. I can use this bug to obtain root access on this local machine. And, and just, to, just to prove that, I actually have the exploit here. <laughs> Did it die because you embedded something uh, bad in response to that, uh, that call? Yeah, it actually died because I'm feeding it 5,000 A's in response to anything it asked me for. So, in this case, it asked me for all that options. I said, okay, here you go. Here's 5,000 A's as my options. And it said, whoa, whoa. And then it died. So, this exploit someone else happened to write. Uh, we, have, we have our own, but it didn't rain. But uh, this sort of technique, as you can see, very quickly, you can kind of root out the, the low-hanging fruit. You can find it. But in the longer term, using this sort of technique, you can find Kind of, you get a fuller sense of how the program works without having to sit there with a disassembler and understand every little thing the program does. And combining the two techniques, you can look at what the program sort of does and kind of the flow of the program and then go into a disassembly and start commenting it up. And so it's more about how, how to use the technique than the fact that I can use shared libraries. But shared libraries themselves become powerful debugging tools especially for finding vulnerabilities. And this is the sort of, sort of result that you're going to get. In 15 seconds, we found, we can find all the vulnerabilities on Solaris that result from this sort of problem. Right? We don't have to go through the source code by hand. At least we can find all the obvious ones. We're obviously going to miss some of the more subtle ones. So can you specify which environment better variables you don't want to send? Yeah, it's a C program. So you can say, if environment equals that, return null which I have in there for some things, because it turns out I investigated them, they were unexploitable, and I don't want to have to worry about that. So it's, it's just very, very configurable because it's up to C. You know, your C is uh, you know, your power, I guess. So is it proprietary? Is it proprietary? Well, it's proprietary, but obviously I'm telling you about it. And it's 50 lines. So, I mean, coding it up tonight would not be a problem. You just, it's a, any shared library, you override a function, you send bad data. Right? I mean, that, yeah, it's I've got a patent on that now, so it's going to pay me. But other than that. Right. So, uh, although I'm not really allowed to send people code, you know, how, how obvious is this? Cynthia wants to know if you patented writing bad data. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Got several patents in the area, portfolio, as they say. Yes. Yeah, my intellectual property lawyer coming out. But uh, so so the last digital delirium copyrighted this particular exploit, which is 
that's a Polish group that does a lot of security research, and I happen to be able to download it this after this weekend because I can't reach my VPN at home and show you mine, and I forgot to bring it with me. Um, but I mean, the, the exploits themselves are really common. This has been happening to Unix for 10 years. Solaris happens to have you know this one and who knows however many more in in their current code base. Um, but I thought this this kind of shows you. Not, not that you can find environment variable overflows, but that you can instrument programs and quickly find vulnerabilities by, by overriding stuff with share files. So you can call yours whatever you want. But uh, now, now that you've seen, does that, anyone have any questions about the demo or anything like that? If you want to look more at how to analyze a core file that it dumps. I mean, that stuff, I think, is, is almost it's universally known how to look at a core dump. Once you crash something, you really have to spend some time analyzing to make sure it is exploitable. In this case, you can just see right off the bat it's exploitable, so it doesn't make a good analysis sort of target. But um, I mean, that, that's a skill that you pick up after a few thousand of these. And now we'll discuss a few defenses. One thing that I've found that some consultants recommend is the non-executable stack, and that is not a defense. And there's many, many reasons why that is not a defense, but, uh, but there's so many that you should just recognize that fact. There's the, the, a non-executable stack does not mean there's a non-executable heap or non-executable text segment, because that would make no sense. Uh, and in any of these cases, as long as you can crash the program, you have to assume it's exploitable uh, by someone who has enough time to sit around thinking of new ways to write exploits, which many people do. Uh, some of them in Poland. Um, it, the, the other defenses people tend to use is like sit down and harden a system, build a secure Solaris build. This is actually quite expensive, and getting it to work with your latest install of Netscape Enterprise Server can sometimes be quite a trial, especially when that install changes. You need to patch one, you've got to change the other. Maintaining this is not cheap, and this is why you kind of see these sorts of problems occurring on production servers. Uh, basically, a lot of the more expensive systems, you know, you see your your highly compartmented, you know, trusted systems, these systems are extremely difficult to maintain. So if, if you're going to be paying me $200,000 a year to maintain your one Solaris box, then, then you might want to just say, well, screw it. We're going to, you know, if they get here and they hack us, we're going to have to absorb that cost. We can't afford to pay someone to mitigate that. Uh, what I'm working on to sort of prevent the general idea and, and keep security as transparent as possible is a kernel module for all set UID files under Solaris, which would wrap them the same way a user level wrapper would. The problem with wrapping a set UID file, which would basically be saying, this file is not set UID, and my program is set UID, and it will call that file for you. But it will clean up the environment, it'll make sure your arguments are small, and this and that. These things are really annoying to maintain. Every time you patch your Solaris box, you have to go back and make sure that you didn't interfere with the way you wrapped all the set UID programs. And I'd like to put that kind of functionality right into the Solaris kernel, right? That way you just load the kernel module, there it is. You patch all you want, the set UID files never have an environment that they have to worry about. Uh, so I'm working on that, but it turns out 64-bit Solaris is very different from 32-bit Solaris, and this uh, gives me headaches late at night. Um, I could steal from a number of things, but I need it to be GPL or, or freely usable. And I haven't seen a whole lot out there for Solaris. And it's all, everyone does their kernel work on Linux. So like, yes, I will learn how to do kernel work on Linux. But it's not at all the same. Or it's a little bit the same, but it's not the same enough. And, and, and I'm talking with a couple guys at Sun. We go back and forth like, yeah, it doesn't work on mine either. I don't know why. All right. So, uh, there are some, some OS's, and generally the more you pay for an OS, the less vulnerable it is to common attacks, because there's less functionality there. That's why you pay more for that particular product. Solaris has lots of functionality, all the commercial Unixes have lots of functionality, and, and Windows, of course, has lots of functionality. And that, that means they're complex, which is going to be the opposite of secure. Uh, so, so in cases where security is extremely, extremely um, important, and that's the only thing, you don't have to worry about scalability or all that other stuff, then we often recommend Linux or any BSDs, which in this particular case, ShareFuzz has found a lot less against. Uh, but of course, no one uses these. So 
We do, however, offer for download a Windows version. And I know many people use Windows. And it's called the Fezzer. A friend of mine named Frank Swiderski wrote it. Um, it's available directly from the Netscape Tools directory. Uh, this is what we use to find the Netscape LDAP vulnerability that we produced an advisory on sometime this year. Uh, we are actually using this sort of tool a lot to find vulnerabilities. There's a lot that goes into uh, kind of quickly reverse engineering something. I mean, again, time is money for a consultant. I can't spend my entire day reading your source code. That, that costs you a lot of money, it costs me a lot of time. Uh, and so we have these tools to help us quickly get to the some, you know, something important so that, so that you can quickly patch it. Uh, Fezzer is named after Fez, who, who was the one who wrote it. Windows, much better Windows programmer than I am. Very, very, very similar though. Like all modern OSs have the shared library concept. He does this just about the same. Um, there's a lot of other automated stress testers. I'll name a few from our competitors for fun of it. But uh, Retina, Liquid Secure, all these things. Uh, they, they all work, but they don't work as well as this. So um, feel free to use Perl scripts of your own to stress test. And, and these are the, this is the sort of product space that, that things like the Fezzer or ShareFuzz exist in. And I wanted to put them up there so when you go into this, you don't think I'm just showing you the way. We, everyone uses a combination of the ways. And that's the end of my show. And I hope you had a good time and, and asked some questions that I don't know the answers to. Because that makes it even more fun. Feel free to heckle me at this point. because you know what they import and export. Like, I didn't need the Solaris code to, to write share fuzz. All I need to know is there's something called get end, and it gets called. And here are the arguments, and here's what it returns. And I just match that. And he does basically the same thing. So it's actually a replacement to MSV CRT or something. Yeah, not a Windows guy. So he, it, there's a whole documentation thing on the website that he gets really into it. And I just nod in my head. But we, we do use these things a lot, so it is good to look at kind of the, the new age of looking for vulnerabilities. You said you would examine the coin dump to determine whether it was an exploitable vulnerability? Yes. Can you say what, what that decision process is, is about? Well, you have to, you assume at first that it's exploitable until proven otherwise, and that almost never happens. But I look to see if it's easily exploitable because I don't have too much time to play with things. Um, you're looking to make sure that the stack-based overflow, right, that it's actually on the stack, which has all the easily exploitable stuff. You're looking to see that you can actually get to the place where you obtain control of program flow. In many cases, if it's a null pointer dereference, or for some reason there's a restricted character set that you're not allowed to use certain characters, and those are the only characters that you can use to return back to memory and all sorts of other fun stuff. So, there's a lot of little tiny things you look at, and usually what you end up doing is just writing a proof of concept exploit, and that tells you, yes, it was vulnerable, or definitely vulnerable. So the gray area is I couldn't figure out how to write the exploit, mm -hmm. but there's these guys in Poland, maybe I'll send it to them. Right? So, not that I do. Yeah. But, you know, that's the, that's the process, looking at the core file, crashing it over and over and over, playing with it a little bit more. ShareFuzz kind of is also pretty easy to use when you're trying to examine exploitability. So, now you mentioned 5,000 A's. Was that just a nice big number that was almost guaranteed to overflow with standard buffer size, or was there well, a good reason? I've used the Solaris for quite some time, and I know that they always like to make their buffers buff size long, or two times buff size long, and at the most, they'll make it four times buff size long, which is 1,024. Mm -hmm. So, well, four times would be 4,096. So I know that I've got a pretty good chance so you're just, you're just finding out that you can overflow a buffer, right? right? You're not trying to find out exactly what memory location over no. the buffer to exploit to get a return address to return right. into a... Not at this stage. This stage is the finding vulnerability stage. Okay, and then, then to go to the next stage, you just modulate that 5,000 and keep right. tweaking it back? So I'll see, we'll see how it behaves under other conditions. 
And once you find that a program behaves admirably, it crashes. I mean, even if that particular condition is not exploitable, probably a similar condition is. Because buggy code is buggy code. You're really looking at who wrote it, not the actual particular instance that they wrote in this case. So, can I ask Windows questions now? We have Rob here. Okay, so let's say uh, some corporation hires you and you come in as the high power consultant and uh, you, you give them your great advice and they take it all and they implement it. At uh, what level of attacker have you just helped them defend against? It's hard to quantify that, right? I mean, it's like if you are perfectly secure, you protect against all the attackers. and, and it's, it, the next version may have a very simple bug. We've really only protected your one version, right? Like, because undoubtedly you have people working on new and more exciting features for the next version. So in a lot of cases, this is really just a way of teaching people the kind of vulnerabilities that they have in their product, which they will then filter down to their developers, and their developers will end up writing better code. So hopefully the, the result is to raise the baseline instead of just chopping it off for once and then letting it grow back. So that made almost no sense. But I guess the idea is that I try to prevent against, in this particular case, we're preventing against the, uh, the bottom rung of hackers. Environment variable overflows have been around forever and they're really kind of easy to find. This makes it even easier, right? It makes your, your easy problems trivial and your uh, hard problems doable, and something like that. So I think that's the Perl model, isn't that it? But uh, yeah, this, this is, you know, I don't, I don't know how skilled I am necessarily. I'm, I'm okay. So it's hard to rate hackers when they get to a certain level. Like, yeah, what are you good at? You're all specialized in your little spider webs. So, yes, not around that. But um, that's, I guess, the answer. Thank you. you work a lot with Sun? Um, I work and a lot with I'm you. So, well, I, have you seen in your working with them any? Um, level of improvement in, in their uh, reduction of buggy code, or are they still just cranking it up on a regular basis? And so with each new release, uh, you have a wide open playing field uh, with new, uh, new and wonderful bugs of the same old kind. I think in general they tend to respond faster now than they used to. Now it's more, more market pressure has been applied, and they tend to say, whoa, okay, bug, we'll fix it. Whereas before they'd be like, yeah, we'll get on that later. Right? we got things to do. And so I think that's definitely changed for the better. In general, I think the switch to GNOME from CDE will be a big improvement. And I think the, uh, the market pressure from Linux has made everyone sort of tighten up a little bit. But uh, in general, the bigger the feature set, the more the bugs. I mean, in particular, this one was an integration of LDAP into their authentication. Uh, but you know, Solaris 8 has a lot more features than Solaris 7. I'm sure we can expect a lot more bugs. You said you were working with Sun with this tool. Are they, are they interested in using this tool to discover flaws in their own product? I'm actually not working with oh, Sun. Okay. I'm working on Sun, I guess is the <laughs> it's not my documentation, right? But uh, <laughs> Sun, in fact, doesn't know about this tool. Oh. I, I don't have like lots of time to go around telling people who don't pay me a lot of money <laughs> that I've written things. That's something I have to do for people who have time to pay. Me. Can I say? When you, when you discover this sort of vulnerability in a system for a client, and you want to patch, patch it, fix that, what kind of loss is involved there, other than the complexity or the maintenance issue? Is there any kind of performance loss or any sort of thing like that when you patch these kind of things? We try to make it. We try to make our solutions fit their business model. If they can afford the money, or the time, or the resources for a really good fix, then we suggest that. But if they can't afford to have someone, you know, do that. For example, a lot of people have really old server software installed so that they can interoperate with old versions of Oracle that they depend on. And, you know, we'd like to say, you must upgrade. But that's too expensive. They can't upgrade everything. Right? It's a lot of money. So in a lot of cases, we're trying to build little structures and shields around what they've actually got and, and help them out that way. But I mean, it's all a matter. It's case by case basis. Do you have the money, time, resources to devote to fixing this particular security problem? And if you do, do you really want to devote it here, or would you rather look at this other problem, or you know, all that stuff?
We have bubble charts and all these other things. In reality, it comes down to what they can afford to do. And they always end up deciding for themselves. So, at least that's how I've seen it. I don't mind my asking kind of a personal question. Does most of your knowledge of this come from just hands-on trying, or do you have like a formal education background where you really study this, or a combination of, of the two? A, a lot. Just you have to read uh, bug track for several years, mm -hmm. and you see, you get kind of a feel for it. You keep interested, and eventually you, you try to progress a little bit further than other people are going, and that's the result of this. This is I like to consider it a little bit farther than most people have gone with this sort of thing. Who knows if someone else is giving this exact same talk right now. But, um, so, that, that's how I came at it. It's, you know, I always strive to be better, stronger, and faster. Right? Mm -hmm. The uh, code red, that's a thing all the papers now, and the worms being so easily disseminated so quickly. I'm just curious what you thought, what is the future of the media? We used to threats, you know, five years ago. The future is .NET, right? <laughs> no, I think, I think, uh, I don't know. In some ways, the future is Java, right? The future is, is languages which, which are more resistant against common attacks. People are getting smarter. They're just doing it really slowly, right? C Sharp is Java. All, all sorts of, you know, the, the in introduction of Python and, and Perl and all these interpreted languages that run themselves in virtual machines you know, that, that whole virtual machine idea, people have decided, was a good idea. And, uh, and so theoretically, eventually, you know, we will be willing to pay that price in performance and memory and other things in order to reduce these sorts of problems by classes. Now, the reality is, uh, you know, as, as the defenses get stronger, we learn about better attacks. So um, this we'll have to wait and see. And, uh, and hopefully it'll be a good time. I'll continue to have a job. I think security in that aspect is more what the industry always has been, which is me measure and countermeasure. And for every countermeasure, we find a way around that. So while right now you're seeing a worm that's going across the internet and compromising 350,000 hosts using a buffer overflow technique, as of last year, year and a half ago, we, we stumbled across the format string issue where you can actually mess with some of the system calls that C is performing and, and mess with the output and put your own code in there, which is it's similar to a buffer overflow, except you're, you're manipulating the buffer directly rather than overflowing any buffer there. And that's a new technique. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it past anybody to code a worm that makes use of a string uh, vulnerability. So I think while you have the, the internet worm, worm right now that's, that's running around buffer overflow, buffer overflow, it's, it's just like right now we're going through the overflow, whereas six months, eight months back, we were going through the email layers. And it, there's always going to be something new. There's always going to be something different. It's just how quickly is the public going to respond to anything new coming out? I guess all, it also comes down to market pressure, right? Didn't the Navy just organize? We're, we're always going to go with IS, everybody. So until, until people like the Navy decide that security is important, uh, Microsoft will continue to make buggy servers because they don't need to spend money making secure servers. And you know, why would they? That's the bottom line. They're a business. And if I was a software producer and my customers didn't care, I wouldn't bother spending money on it either. And, and that's you guys. So it's, it's really your fault. <laughs> <laughs> I know we touched on this earlier in the week about not just buggy uh, code, but the Easter eggs and what the developers put in there will I know you shocked me with the numbers, but I think the audience get an appreciation of what they don't know about. Right. Well, you got to figure uh, for every exploit that's released, for every exploit that's discussed, that the public is made aware of. You got to figure vendors like Microsoft have their their little bug database holding bugs, and and they're resolving through it. Since it's not public and it's not some devastating exploit, it it doesn't need to be taken care of immediately. And uh, when, I was, when I was employed at Microsoft, I believe the, the current measure at any time was for every five public exploits that were released, there was roughly 2,500 bugs in their database unresolved. So of these 2,500 bugs, how many of them were remote vulnerabilities? How many were local? How many weren't vulnerabilities at all just crashing the system? Who can really say? But 
you, you always got to remember, the vendor is always holding something back. If the vendor can stop from throwing it in your face and saying, hey, we really screwed up here. You guys are in big trouble. They're going to do that. And, and they're going to wait for you to download that next service pack that quietly puts the fixed file on your hard drive. And again, not only do the vendors hold back, but the hackers hold back too. We're not the only ones doing vulnerability research. And when you typically tell a vendor, hey, we found a bug in your product, they're like, great, we'll get to that. Six months later, an advisory comes out. So if you look at kind of the fix time, you have to imagine we're not the only ones who found it six months ago. So, I mean, you're exposed that entire time. I mean, you're exposed for the previous history of the product. And, and, and if you're not worrying about that now, you probably should be. Vendors generally don't want to blow up the, the importance of, of patches also. So if I'm sitting back and I have a vulnerability that's going to compromise everybody's system in this room, and I go to the vendor and, and you know, I'm, I'm a nice guy and I go to them and I say, hey, I found this problem, you guys should fix it. They're like, okay, you know, just shut up about it, we'll sweep it under the rug. And, and two months later, they come out with a patch for it. Yeah, we patched it, nobody's gonna be vulnerable. And then, well, we wanna put the patch out there, but we don't want the public to go into panic. We don't want the public to lose, you know, we don't want our company to lose face. They're not gonna say, install this immediately, or you're all dead. They're going to say, here's a new, here's a new patch for, for an existing problem. Yeah, it's nothing big. You know, install it when you got the time. If you see something like that, how many of you are, are going to install it like that? Not a lot. So you're going to sit there and remain vulnerable for something that is known, for something that the vendor has addressed. They just haven't properly notified you. Hmm. What would you say the uh, turnaround time for both fixes is and the open source community? Uh -huh. A couple hours, depending on what it is. If you're looking at the like a kernel level fix, it can be a couple days because it has to be a good fix. If it's a quick fix, you'll get it in a couple hours. And, and that's definitely going to be, I mean, part of your your measure of, of how secure a system is. But in that in that case as well, the bug itself has existed for the previous history of the product, and, and you have to kind of think of it as you know, it was a problem before, just as much as it is now that you know about. Before we continue this discussion, um, I know some of you may have to take buses or transportation home. We've reserved uh, 529, which is just up the stairs and down the hall, one or two doors, where uh, those of you who are interested, anybody still interested, can come in and, and uh, talk with uh, our visitors some more about various vulnerabilities and, and system problems. So. Um, I'd like to, at this point, close the discussion and then move up. Or if there's so many of you who want to stay, we'll just stay in this room, I suppose. But, um, uh, either move upstairs, uh, but let those of you who have to go, go. And at this point, I'd like to thank you for 